They were called angels of mercy on the battlefield. Their mission was saving lives, comforting the wounded, gently reassuring those who are about to enter the next life. Their heroics went largely unnoticed by the public and press, but not by the soldiers that they cared for. The unrelenting passage of time threatens to relegate them further to the recesses of our memory, but their heroics should always remain front and center. They were the nurses of World War II, and what they lacked in medals and public acclamation, they made up for with lifelong appreciation and gratitude from the sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines whose lives they touched, and the quiet satisfaction of knowing that they more than contributed to the war effort. I'm Nick Ragone with This Date in History, and though there are thousands of stories we could tell, in this video, we focus on three such World War II heroes, Ruby Bradley, Jane Kendai, and Grace Chicken. Upon graduating nursing school in 1933, Ruby Bradley entered the U.S. Army as a surgical nurse and served at Walter Reed Hospital until 1940, when she was transferred to Camp John Hay on the island of Luzon in the Philippines. She was there on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and hours later would attack the American defenses in the Philippines. American forces were quickly overrun, and the survivors attempted to flee to Manila through the mountains. Ruby Bradley walked more than 18 miles to Lesud, where she cared for civilian refugees, many of them women and children. Just days after Christmas, she and another nurse were captured, becoming the first nurse POWs of World War II. Nurse Bradley and others set up a small camp hospital, which was little more than a tent with some cots and supplies. It soon became a maternity ward and nursery, and they amazingly delivered 13 babies among the civilian prisoners of war. In September of 1942, Ruby Bradley was transferred to the Santo Tomas internment camp in Manila, joining other U.S. Army and Navy nurse prisoners of war. It might have been a change of scenery, but it didn't change her service to others. Despite their near starvation and lack of proper equipment and supplies, Bradley and her fellow nurses scrounged what they could and improvised solutions, like pulling threads from raw hemp to use for skin sutures, making soap from the lye from wood ashes, and digging up worms for food. I will eat them for the good of my country, she would tell herself every time she downed a slimy morsel. The POWs lived on half a cup of rice a day, though Bradley even less than that, as she routinely gave her meager portions to those who needed it. The formerly 114 pound nurse would drop to 82 pounds, but even in that she found benefit. My baggy clothes made it easier for me to smuggle food and contraband to other prisoners without attracting the guard's attention, she would remark some 50 years later at a White House ceremony. She did her best to remain a beacon of hope for the sick and suffering prisoners of war, though witnessing the daily deaths of her fellow internees would haunt her for the rest of her life. When Manila was liberated in February 1945, Ruby Bradley returned back to the United States. The war was over for her, but it wasn't the end of her military career. In 1950, now Major Ruby Bradley took over as the chief nurse for the 171st Evacuation Hospital during the Korean War and when their position was overrun by 100,000 Chinese troops pouring over the 38th parallel, Bradley refused to evacuate until every last sick and wounded person was in the air. She jumped aboard the final plane just as her ambulance exploded from an enemy shell, narrowly averting death. In 1951, Ruby Bradley was made the chief nurse for the 8th Army, where she supervised 500 Army nurses throughout Korea. When she left Korea in 1953, she was the first woman in history to be given a full dress honor guard ceremony. Ruby Bradley retired from the army in March 1963 as a full colonel, one of only three nurses to hold that permanent rank, and having earned a total of 34 medals and citations, making her the most highly decorated female U.S. veteran. She would continue to work as a civilian nurse in her home state of West Virginia for two decades before finally retiring. Ruby passed away in 2002 at the age of 94. She is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. When the naval air transport broke through the clouds of volcanic dust and smoke to land on Iwo Jima on March 6, 1945, it carried more than just blood and medical supplies for the wounded on that battered speck of rock. On board this inaugural air evacuation flight was a 22-year-old nurse named Jane Kendai, making her the first Navy flight nurse to serve on an active Pacific battlefield. Other nurses would soon follow, and during the three weeks of ferocious fighting, they would help air evacuate nearly 3,000 Marines and sailors from Iwo Jima. Following the battle, the photogenic Kendai was sent stateside to do a war bond tour, but soon after requested to be transferred back to the Pacific to be with her boys. And on April 7, 1945, she did just that, becoming the first flight nurse to arrive in Okinawa, where over the next two months, she and her fellow flight nurses would perform the largest casualty evacuation operation in United States military history. 
Okinawa would account for a staggering 17% of the total Navy and Marine Corps casualties suffered during World War II. Years later, she was asked by a reporter how the men responded to seeing her on the battlefield. The same as other places, she responded with a broad smile, they whistled. During her 20 years in the Army Air Force and then the Air Force, she served in World War II, the Korean War, and the early part of Vietnam before finally retiring as a Lieutenant Colonel. Her name was Grace Chicken, and as an Aravac flight nurse, she would spend more time in the air tending to the wounded than any nurse in history. Born just weeks before the onset of World War I, from the earliest age, Grace Chicken's only ambition was to be an Army nurse. She would get her chance in 1940, joining the Army to become part of the inaugural class of Aravac nurses who were specifically trained to fly with wounded soldiers being flown to a hospital for additional treatment. On board their specially crafted DC-4s, the AirVac crews darted in and out of battle zones to transport the wounded, often dodging enemy flak and fighters along the way. Nursing at 20,000 feet in a war zone is different from nursing in a hospital, she was fond of noting. When the war ended in Europe, it didn't end for Grace Chicken. She requested a transfer to the Pacific Theater. Three days after the armistice, she found herself in Tokyo transporting emaciated and sickened American prisoners of war, some that had survived the Corregidor death march. Bless your heart, one of them kept saying to me over and over again. Grace could still recall 70 years later. We knew you would come and get us. We just knew. Now Captain Grace Chicken would spend the Korean War shuttling the wounded back and forth from the battlefield to hospitals across Korea and Japan. Her style of nursing went beyond just bandages and IVs. If the soldier was blinded, she would hold his hand for the entire flight for comfort. If they were unconscious or shell-shocked, she would gently sing to them, telling them everything would be all right. If they didn't make it, she would say a prayer and try to remember them as much as possible. Grace would briefly serve in Vietnam before retiring after 26 years in the Air Force as a Lieutenant Colonel in 1968. I loved it, Grace would say shortly before receiving her final flight wings at the age of 107. I would do it all over again in a heartbeat. She would live to be 107 and credit the secret to her longevity with having a sip of scotch and water every day. Three extraordinary women, though we could equally have told the stories of countless thousands others. They served their country with valor, integrity, empathy, and devotion. They touched innumerable lives in ways known and unknown to them. They were truly angels and fatigues. For this date in history, I'm Nick Ragone.